It's 11 o'clock. <laughs> welcome to church, everybody here and online. Great to see you. And it's a joy to welcome visitors who will be included in the children's work next, through next door. And great to see some friends back from the mainland. Uh, so just a few notices. Um, after the Kirk session, it's just booming a wee bit today, or is it me booming? Uh, after the Kirk session on Thursday, a couple of decisions were made, and I'd like to invite people to be part of the door greeters. Now, if, if you're from the northeast of Scotland, where they speak the Dalek, <laughs> greeting is not something you want to happen. <laughs> greeting means crying. We want to greet people cheerfully, welcomers. It's okay if they greet going out, <laughs> especially if it's godly sorrow, which leads to repentance and there's tears. We don't mind that at all. So if you would like to be on the door, I remember some time back, we were just about to, to set it up with some ladies too. Please don't feel you're excluded. And then the dreaded lockdown came and it's been forgotten, but it was mentioned last night. So please just speak to one of the elders and yeah, be included in that. And the other thing, it's not glamorous at all. Uh, would you like to be part of the cleaning rota? That's 15 hands gone straight up. It's amazing, <laughs> the servant spirit in this church. Again, if you'd like to take part, um, please just let us know. And uh, it's good that we're flexible in this church. And with John Akaska's <laughs> absence this morning, we've just, just asked young Zoe to sit in on the desk, on the tech desk, and she's helping out. So that's a wonderful servant, a wonderful attitude. So please, names afterwards of those who you'd like to be if you'd like to be involved in that. Now, on f there'll be a funeral here on Wednesday. We just got word of this yesterday. A lady, Barbara Ann Barrett from Callanish, who uh, some of you will know and remember, and she passed away on Friday, and her funeral will be here. And I'll be meeting the family later on today. So if you, if you remember her, uh, if you're free on Wednesday morning, come along. Now, the final thing, I haven't noticed, I haven't mentioned this before, uh, but some of you will know that I, I'll be leading a tour group to Israel in October, and it's been on my Facebook page for a little while, I'm not trying to promote it too much, um, but we have a small group, and I would like to keep it relatively small, but if anyone here or watching online would like to come on this wonderful uh, seven-day tour to Israel, then please get in touch this week. We're going to try and confirm all the numbers so we can make our make our bookings for flights and hotels. So it would be lovely to see somebody uh, as a result of today's notice. So these are all our information to start off. Welcome everybody. Let's join our hearts and worship as we begin with Psalm 46, singing verses 1 to 7 and 10 to 11.
as the Lord of my soul. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing that it is to gather in your house today with your people, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we join with one heart and with one voice to give praise to our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of all faithfulness throughout all generations, and the God that we confess as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal God, the unchanging one. We thank you, God, that we have security in you and in your name as we dwell under the shadow of the Almighty this day in this church. And for those who gather with us, Lord, may there be that sense that God has come, come near to bless, to reveal himself in his grace, in his forgiveness, and by his holy presence. Lord, we covet, as it were, a people ascending to the highest places where we would meet with God upon the mountain of the Lord, where we would leave behind the affairs of the world down in the valley and, and press in and seek to, to meet with God. As we have seen in scripture so often, Lord, even Jesus himself set himself apart from the disciples and from ministry, went up to a lonely, solitary place, even on a hill, and prayed to God the Father. How much more do we then as his people need to come before that, that throne of heaven and ask for grace and mercy for this very day, peace and healing, healing in our lives, Lord, for we are a broken people in so many ways. We may look well on the inside, but on the outside, but inside there are many fragmentations of our heart, our emotions, brokenness, sorrows, as well as the joys that we carry. So Lord, today, will you stretch forth your hand here upon us, upon us all who gather and heal. And if there are those who are brokenhearted and sorrowful, those who are troubled in their soul and spirit, will you bless them, Lord, and build them up in their faith. Give them peace, the peace that is your gift and your gift alone to give, which passes all our understanding. It surpasses all other peace that we can know upon the earth. So we come and ask the Prince of Peace to breathe upon us as a church, to make us a living, vibrant fellowship, meaningful to the community, meaningful to our island, that we will be a congregation that prays, prays for the well-being of all its citizens in every village and across the town of Stornoway. We love the place that you have planted us here, Lord. We thank you for those who you have joined from other nations from across the world to come and live in Lewis. And we pray that they truly will find something precious at the heart of community life here, but that they will meet with the God who has met with this island folk over many generations. Lord, we thank you that you are the faithful one who has looked down upon communities of prayer, praying people over the centuries, and caused the wind of heaven to blow upon them. And we are here again, Lord, in this day and generation, and we desperately need the Spirit of God to breathe upon us again, to stir us all and to awaken the island, to awaken every citizen, every boy and girl, that they will hear the voice of Jesus calling, come unto me and rest for your soul. This is our earnest prayer, Lord, for us as a church, that there be a fragrance going forth today, even from our service, that the word will be a blessing and encouragement, that the word sometimes too will cause a division for Jesus said, I come to bring peace, but also come to bring a sword. A sword that will divide families, those who are for Jesus and those who are against. But we pray, Lord, for the quickening of your word, which is the sword of the spirit, that it will penetrate the deep places of each person's spirit, soul, mind this day. And cause us to cleave to Christ. Cause us to leave behind the shadows and the vanities and the foolish things that so preoccupy us. And to see in Christ the one who is of the utmost value and preciousness to our lives. Lord, may you by your spirit accomplish that which is impossible for us in all our best efforts. We thank you for our friends who've gathered with us here today, Lord. Bless their time here in the service and in their stay in Lewis. We thank you for one another as a community. We thank you for the bonds of our villages and having visited my home village yesterday, I thank you for the preciousness that retains there the people who are still bonded together and we are renewed our, our friendship. And for many of us, Lord, it's like that. There is a, 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 
a wonderful binding and bonding with our past. But we today, Lord, we want to, as we remember, we want to look forward and say, Lord, will you do great and wondrous things in these days? Will you bind us to your covenant word again as a people, as a church? May we pick up that which we've let f fall to the ground. May we pick up all the promises of scripture. May we be faithful to the morality that's expressed in the Bible, faithful to Jesus, and turn our backs on all in the world that would persuade us to go its way. So bless our hearts, Lord. Bless our friendship together from the start of the service through to the door is locked when we part. Come near to us all, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before the next hymn, I'm just going to do a little intro on the guitar. How does that sound to you? <laughs> in tune? Too late. Oh, too late then. No, that's, that was, is it in tune or not? <laughs> I asked somebody today, and he said, I, I don't know, I can't tell if it's in tune or not. Now, that person has in, has in the past admitted to being tone deaf. <laughs> but I won't mention who it is. But I think most of you would say, that guitar is out of tune. Well, just, we're going to sing the next hymn, O Come of Fountain of Every Blessing, Tune My Heart. And I'm going to uh, incorporate this later into the sermon. But I'm going to tune the guitar. And there's a, a, a button here, a button on the guitar, modern guitarists have. You just press it, and it shows you which string, which string is out of tune. And then you tune it up, and when it goes to green, you're in tune. So I'm going to do that, if you'll bear with me.
I'm going to read the scripture, but just one notice that I forgot to mention. We're hoping next week to have the fellowship walk that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, starting at South Shoppers Beach. And if we're inviting you to meet with us at 11 o'clock next Saturday morning, bring a packed lunch, walking boots. No need for raincoat, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> but but we'll, I'll, I'll post it on Facebook on Friday night, just a confirmation that the weather is nice and clear. So we're going to walk a reasonable distance, come back to car park, have a picnic and sing some songs and go home happy. Nay greeting, but happy. So that's that. So reading the scriptures, that, is that what's next? Ephesians chapter 2, from the beginning, verses 1 to 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. May God bless this word to us. And as we prepare to hear the word, we will, in many respects, do what we're going to say in the next song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And we'll stand to sing.
Let's sing that chorus one more time. Let's sing the chorus one more time. Turn your hands. Who we'll sing the chorus? sounded so beautiful. I didn't want to stop. Don't put the title up yet, guys, at the back. Uh, so in our congregation, we have skilled workmen. We have joiners, builders, electricians, mechanics. And in their profession, precision counts. It counts for everything. Accuracy in planning and calculating and in creating. And every step of the way has to be measured with the expectation that the end product is going to be what they planned at the very beginning. That's, that's what their hope is. And if they were just to roughly guess or have a calculation that's not based on any statistics, they were, the likelihood is that the product that they're working on will end up as a bit of a mess. It wouldn't be what they wanted. And I know the skilled workmen here, none of them would ever do, do such a thing. Precision <coughs> calculation. If they do their job professionally and well, the end product will be just exactly what it, they want it to be. Whether it's a car component fitted well, whether it's a, a fuse in a power board, a doorway, or a roof. All these things require skill, craftsmanship, and real effort to, to, for it to work out. But if they fail to do all these things, or any of them, what will happen? There will be a misfit. A misfit. And that leads me to today's unusual title, which is a question for us all today. Are you a good fit or a misfit? I won't ask you to raise your hands at the moment to see which category, I'm sure. But let, let, just let me explain it, biblically answer, anecdotally. Recently, I sent away for a new cover for this tablet. It's getting frayed. You probably can't see it, but it's frayed and a bit tatty and it's not looking so, so good. So I said, right, time for a new one. And uh, I identified it, the type usually is by the screen size. Uh, the screen uh, size made, made, made the choice. And it was also very cheap, which kind of persuaded me even more. So I sent away a few days later, it came, I ripped open the package and <laughs> slotted it in, or at least I tried to slot it in. And it just wouldn't fit. It was at least a couple of centimeters uh, longer than, well, my tablet was a little a couple of centimeters longer than this. So I thought, now what do you do if you get a product that's faulty? I know you're supposed to back it up, send it back to them and ask for a refund. But I thought this time, you know, I'm going to keep it. Because I, I think it's going to fit into a sermon something. And I, <laughs> and I just wanted it to be on hand so I wouldn't forget it. So I didn't send it back. I didn't get my money back. So, But it's, it, I think it's, it's worth it. I hope. In it. So I'm going to try and fit things in to the sermon today, to fit elements in, and I hope that, in, in a sense, a parable will fit in to the, the topic today. Now, it may be a generalization, which I usually try and avoid, but I think we could pos probably say that it's fairly accurate that we all desire to fit in somewhere in life, to fit in, whether it's with our contemporaries, our peer groups, our work, our work groups, our family circle. Our fam we all want to, to fit in with that. It's a natural thing, it's a healthy thing to, f to want to fit in. Are you hearing okay? It's an instinctive thing that we want to fit in. And throughout the developing years as teenagers, there is a prominent <laughs> yet unseen force. Can, Sorry, I shouldn't detract like that, just waiting. Are you okay now? Can you hear it? Okay. There is a, there's a, an unseen force that works on teenagers to try and compel, persuading them at first, compelling them to, 
fit into one of the many groupings that, that are emerging in their life, whether it's sport, whether it's music, social, whether it's cultural, a wide range of, of areas of life. There's uh, this pressure, sometimes subtle, sometimes it's overt, to try and coerce people. Uh, that's the power of advertising, and it's directed towards youth so that they will buy the latest clothes or whatever it is, and they're trying to be moulded so that they will fit into your category group. So you don't want to come to school wearing something different to everybody else there. They've got this label, they've got this type of clothes, so you want to fit in, and so there is power, per persuasion to, to adopt that and to be like them. And I think it's a natural thing for us just not to want to stand out in the crowd, but to be accepted by this group. So we adopt their ways, their language, their patterns of, of thought. And I, I remember very well myself from my school days, although it's 50 years ago. <laughs> yes, it is 50 years ago. The power of persuasion was as prominent then, the subtleties, you know, to become like this. And in those days, fortunately and unfortunately, there was no school uniform. It was, it was a great freedom in a way. So you could dress in any way. It didn't last too long, but people brought in the uniform. But you could dress in your own way. And I remember having two unique items of clothing which no one else in school had. And you felt different. But generally, you were coerced. The school uniform came, and you all... And it's a beautiful school uniform, I say, for the Nicholson Institute. I would love to be back there and wear it again this day. So the power, is, the power of peer group pressure is prominent throughout our lives. And it, it doesn't... It often affects people who are easily led astray. Now, none of us would readily admit to that, but we can be uh, impressionable young men and women, boys and girls, and we want to fit in. So we allow things to influence our thought patterns and our behavior, and so we're absorbed into groups that maybe we wouldn't have necessarily chosen, uh, but we find ourselves in. And once you're in a group, it's difficult to extract yourself. But it doesn't stop with teenagers. It's with us for the rest of our lives. The power of persuasion to shape and mold us, to fit us into a pattern that the world would seek to, to have for us. And the, the world does have an outline, a shape, that it wants its citizens to adopt. And the kingdom of God has another shape and mold that he, God wants us to adopt. And they don't fit. You can't ram one cover into the other. And so they're at variance with one another. And we need to know what we are being molded into. Where do you fit in and where do you not fit in? And this is a general uh, word to everyone watching very much today. So that's the pressure to make you squeeze in, to fit into a mold that maybe doesn't suit you like that one didn't suit the tablet. It is a misfit. And I believe that the world system has a conveyor belt of churning out misfits. Absorb, getting people while they're young, impressionable, and leading them into avenues of their life where they wouldn't have chosen. And years later, with regret, they look back and say, I wish I hadn't taken that way. I wish that I hadn't done that. And we all, and many of us, have seasons of regret as we look back. If I hadn't met this person who persuaded me to go, come with me, and uh, we were led astray. Now, we were created uniquely, each one of us, we were created, and there's a, a verse, it's just a phrase at the end of the chapter there. We are God's workmanship. As I've spoken of craftsmen, engineers, builders, scientists, God is the perfect workman, building us, and we are his workmanship. It says, if we are in Christ Jesus, we have been created in him to do good works which he has already prepared for us. It's a wonderful sense of knowing that there's a destiny that God has prepared into which you and I will just fit perfectly. We will just fit in and there'll be that resonance within you that you, this is, this is right for my life. This is the right person to marry. This is the right city to live in. This is the right career for me. And there's a tremendous peace and reassurance that comes. And although many of us are older, we can still need that sense. I'm sure you, before you made the big move from far off on the other side of the world, you prayed and asked God to lead you and you knew it was right for you to come to this place. And so you fitted in and you found a community and you found an interaction in the church. And these things are so important.
to fit in and to feel it would be a terrible thing if you come and live on the island and you find yourself estranged and not fitting in. And when I was visiting down the west side yesterday, I again raised the, the comment about one or two people in our old village who are just misfits. They have come and they never have fitted into any aspect of community life, religious life. They are totally at variance. And it, it seems strange. If you come from a city or far off, to a community, a rural community, you expect people to be involved in the, the activities. So, so it is strange, but God has designed each one of us in a perfect way that we'll fit in to what? Into his kingdom, into the works that he has prepared for us. We all look alike, but we have a different fitting and fixture. And God is the master craftsman seeking to place you. Some of you, maybe most of you, have found your place in life where you have fitted in but some of you maybe not yet. And even if you're older, you can still feel uh, an unease about where you are in life, that you're not quite fitting in as you feel, you don't feel all that fully comfortable in every area of your life. You may feel comfortable at home with your wife and children at work, but there's just something yet, a rough edge, an edge that's overlapping that hasn't been, been uh, brought into this, into this parameter that God wants to bring us in. God is the perfect creator the workmanship. We are the works of his hands as he created Adam and Eve, male and female, the beauty, the perfection. We were made in the image of God. We are the works of his hands. And that doesn't stop when we're born. It continues. There's a design pattern for us for the rest of our lives. And I see it in the, in the parable or the metaphor of the, the potter and the clay. Our lives, if we, if we yield to the Lord, are the clay. And we say, Lord, have your way and shape me and mould me into who you want me to be. We might want to be, have aspirations for this, but the potter might say, that's not for you. That will lead to destruction. Let me shape and mould you. But many people are reluctant to let go of the reins of their life and say, Lord, I hand over to you. It's not capitulation. It's not surrender. It is yielding to one who knows perfectly what's best for your life. So we say, Lord, Please, take the reins of my life. Whatever age you are, if you haven't yielded your reins of your life to God, you are still determined to shape and form you self for yourself. And it may be reasonably beneficial, but it won't be fully beneficial. There comes a time when many a person, and it often happens when Sunday school finishes, the years of Sunday school and teaching, and people then sort of cast off what the church has been uh, bring it into their lives and say, no, I, I just want to be free from all, from all that and find my own destiny and identity. And to some extent, they, they just drop it. Some reject it very vigorously and uh, renounce anything to do with the church. And so there is a, a group of people wandering around looking to find an identity. So what does the, the Christian gospel have to say about, about this? But well, I, I could summarize it in the words of, of the last hymn. What are we being shaped into mold? We're not to look at the models of this world and say, I would really like to be like him or like her. No, we are to turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the world that are trying to persuade us and shape us and mold us will just fade away and recede, and we'll see in Jesus someone, something more valuable than anything we could ever decide in life. The things of this world that have tried to grip you and hold you, will, you will just let go of and you'll see them as secondary. Maybe even as Paul said, the things that I counted everything, I count now for, as loss. For the, for the sake of gaining knowledge of Christ. And when you see what you gain by losing, but some people say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to let go of the reins of my life fully. In part, I let go in part, but not altogether. So I believe if we're to mold ourselves on anyone, we're to do it on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we're to mold our life, our character, upon him. Because in Hebrews it says, he's the creator and the perfecter of our faith. He's the workman who's at work in our lives, trimming the edges, making sure that we fit in. He knows what is best for our faith to grow. So we yield. And when we become Christians, we partake of his divine nature. Now that's what the scripture says, by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has come in now to mold you and I into the character of and the beautiful character of Jesus. Everything about Jesus was beautiful and attractive 
and people that spiritualize. The way he spoke to the Dalilites. Like the way he conversed with the prostitutes, the lepers, the way he cut himself down to the lowest place, humbled himself, which many people then and still would not do. But that we see in that the character that we should emulate, that we should have that very nature of Christ within us. And as we yield to the Spirit of God, so we become like Christ in our behavior, in our speech. And there can be no higher model in, in all of life than for you and I to, to mould ourselves and to consciously, Lord, shape me and mould me according to, according to Christ, because he is the perfect, the perfect model for us. We are not to be moulded, strangely enough, and this might come as a wee bit of a, a negative thing, we're not to be moulded by the church or the Christian community, necessarily. And by that I mean, there are subtle and sometimes overt pressures exerted by the church to make believers conform to codes, to practices, to behaviours, even to dress code. And we on this island know all about that. What used to be acceptable and unacceptable. If you in previous times came to church without a hat, and there's men and women, <laughs> you would not be accepted. You, you, you would just not fit into the norm. The norm it was that you had hats and you would never be allowed into church wearing jeans and a t-shirt that was just it. And we know I've spoken before about the Jesus Revolution in California when God began to move with the young people, the, the hippies on the beach, and they came to church and they came in their jeans and beads and people would say, oh no, you can't come in here. See, they were making a judgment based on the outward. But God makes a judgment based on the heart. And in Romans 12, 14, Paul says, never judge anyone. Don't enter into a judgment about them, about what they dress, what days they count as holy or special or what they eat or what they don't drink. And we're so, so liable, so, it's so almost natural to make judgments of people based on these externalities. And so we, we try to renounce that because that's not the way of Jesus. Jesus never made a judgment upon anyone based upon their, their appearance, their background, their upbringing, their affluence or whatever. And neither should we. All these things are an outward show. And we, we are to let no man, even the church system, which is not as rigid as it used to be here in Lewis, it used to be severely rigid. And if you fit it in, you fit it, but it was a very narrow, narrow path. We've broadened that path and long before I ever came back home. So it was an eye-opener to see it again, how things have changed. But I get, we have to say we mustn't let all restraint go. And let anything go, and anything can happen. No, that's, that's not the way. There are godly restraints and exercise that discipline the church and our behavior. And, but we allow God to do that. It's not, for, it's not for the pastor to come up to say, excuse me, brother, and excuse me, sister, but I, I think what you're doing and saying is totally wrong and unacceptable. Because then I'm entering into a judgment. It may be wrong according to my standard, but that's not the standard of the church. The standard of the church is Jesus' standard. And sometimes I fall very far short of that. And I'll speak out of my human sinful nature. So I've got to curb. And if we do that, if we all do that, just restrain ourselves and not pass judgment. We will be, in a sense, creating that atmosphere where Jesus is more present, more present by his Spirit. Jesus came to reveal the Father. We know that in one of his discourses he said to the his, his doubting disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You have seen the Father, the eternal, invisible, only wise God. You have seen him because I am him. And as Hebrews says, he is, he is the exact representation of the unseen God. So in Christ, we see God who is invisible. And therefore, we see the Father. And therefore, God himself is the perfect uh, craftsman to craft your life and mine. And so when we look at Christ... We see the Father and we hear what he is saying to us. And we are then displaying spiritual, a, a sort of a character that's spiritually as perfect as we can get. We don't become spiritually perfect by emulating one another, revering a minister or an elder or an international speaker. No, no, no. Because even in recent months and years, some of the great international speakers have fallen, fallen severely into sin and shame and 
It's still ongoing, south of England, things like that. So we never make that pedestal for, to, to revere speakers because they're flawed. Each one has to continue in that sense of the fear of God, lest they would fall into sin too. We want to be like my guitar. Out with Christ we are a discordant, unpleasant sound. But spiritually speaking, when God, God presses that, that button, I'm going to call it the, the G button in us. When I press that button, it showed, showed who was out, what was out of tune with the guitar. And then it shows you how to get in tune. And God's word and the leading of Jesus and the Spirit shows each one of us how to bring your life into the right balance. Yes, we all need to be rebalanced, recalibrated from time to time. And so we come to Jesus and to the Father, say, Lord, press the button in me that brings me back into alignment with your perfect will. So would you maybe pray that today, every one of you in some capacity? Lord, if I've gone off alignment in some way, and you know if you drive and your car's out of alignment with one wheel, the car is, takes that kind of fear. So make sure that each of us today and I'm not preaching down to you, I'm just saying as an encouragement to, to, to recheck your life. The word says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your mind by reading the scriptures, by listening to what the Lord will say to your heart. And as we do, we, we're yielding and we're following the pattern and the design of the master. And then you and I become the fulfilled person that God designed for your life. And even though you're 60, 70, 80, there's still a destiny for you to fulfill. It's not all over. There is a place and a time in God uh, whereby he will shape and mold you and bring you in, into a new season in your life. I, I think that's, that's the nature of God. We don't become useless to God or to society when we get old. Not at all. Unless we choose to be. Put the slippers on and not come out in it. But we, we want to engage in life. So there's a, a good number of us over a certain age. And I hold out that hope that our lives can yet be, your life can be fulfilling in your service and in your knowledge of God. Uh, but God is the great benefactor. He's not the great detractor. And many as a person had a wrong thinking of God that he was going to take this, this and this away from me. Oh, well, I'm not going to come to... If that's God, if that's the Christian God, I'm not... But God is completely different. He's our benefactor. He may take things from us that will detract from our well-being, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, but that's because we are yielding to him. And we want to be able to say, truly, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I grudgingly give, no, I freely give. And we would hope that everyone here and watching can truly say that. Or there may be some who are saying, oh, most, most of what I have, I yield to Jesus. Well, that's that bit that you haven't yielded is the bit that's overlapping the edge. It's not fitting in. Until you yield that bit and let go of it, you will not fit into what God has for you because you are saying, I know better than God. And I'm going to hold on to that a little bit because it's important to me. And I would exhort everyone not to hold on to things that you know in your heart will detract from your well-being. Getting back to the, the parable that I was trying to convey with the, the cover of the trim. Until you, each one of us, are trimmed around the edges, the rough places made smooth, broken parts mended. We will not fit into the space that God has reserved for you and I in his kingdom. We will be misfits, spiritual misfits. And to be a good fit with God, you and I need to allow his hands to shape and mold us, to trim off these unwanted rough edges. I trust that we're all willing to do that. And then we will be a perfect fit. The only right fit for us has been preached here in recent week. What's that? The only right fit for you and I is, is, is the same one, is to be in Christ. That is the, the one that fits us all perfect. There's not one size fits all. That's true. But there's one Christ that fits us all. And when we find our place in him, we will know within ourselves that we are truly in a place that we fit in perfectly. 
Do you fit in to the Christian life? Do you fit into church life? Do you feel comfortable in church? Or do you feel com more comfortable out with Christian company? Talking about sports and other things, worldly things, nothing wrong with it. Do you feel more comfortable chatting with the guys in the community than having some Christian fellowship with some guys who may talk about sport and, and music and stuff, but also in their hearts they talk about the Lord and spiritual things? It shows you where your heart is. If you'd rather be with that company than with God's people, then it shows you that you are, you're still a misfit. You're a misfit, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not wishing to speak condemnation to anyone, but just to, for us all to reappraise our lives. Am I like that? Let God touch that G button in your life. Let him harmonize your heart and tune it to sing his praise. And singing is so important. My own view for what it's worth is unless a person has a physical ailment or illness, if they cannot sing, if they cannot move their lips to sing praises in church, it shows where their heart is. Grace when grace comes to a person's life, one of the first things that they do is they sing God's praise. It's a natural thing. Jesus said, when the Pharisees were rebuking his disciples because they were singing, making noise, he said, even the very stones will praise him. So if God can make the stones praise him, why doesn't every man and woman who comes to church move their lips and sing God's praise? It seems unnatural. It seems unnatural to do it otherwise. That's that's my view of understanding of script. A heart that has been touched by grace will naturally express its praise to God. And if you're not singing God's praise, then it questions whether your heart has been fully, it may have been slightly touched, but there's a lot more for it to be touched by yet. And please, I appeal to everyone who doesn't sing, here or at home, to question yourself and say, why don't I sing? Am I so proud? Am I so arrogant? And you know, this week we'll have a funeral here. It may not be a large one, but at some of the large, huge gatherings when it's been packed all the way up here. And I'm standing here and singing, and I'm looking around, and I'm catching so, so many people of the community, and I'm sorry to say mostly men. Not a, not a movement of the lips, not an expression, even of... Even if you could sing Psalm 23, which we will sing, everybody sing. If you cannot sing Psalm 23 at a funeral, I just wonder, where, where are you? So please, sing God's praises. Be a man of God, be a woman of God, and sing God's praises. Don't be proud and say, oh, no, I'm not going to sing like that. Let it go. It's a Lewis thing. You see it in other places too. I don't know what it is, but it's time to let it go. We're here, touched by grace. Let God tune your voice. It's not to do with how good a voice you have. It's just to thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to sing your praises next week. And I would love it. I would love to hear more praises. I love hearing some of the male voices down here at the front and up at the back. It's, it's a wonderful thing to balance out. So come on, men. Come on of this church. Be a praising people. A man who's been touched by the Lord. So friends, in winding down, do you all feel that you fit into the Christian faith? Does it feel natural for you to be a Christian? Or are you still just squeezed into the very thought of being a Christian? I squeeze myself into church or I squeeze myself in, but that's as far as I get. Come on now. Come on now. Today's lesson, I hope there's, one, there's, hope there's a number of lessons. Why don't you let go and let God shape you? Why don't you let go fully and say, today I'm going to let go. I'm going to listen to what that man has been preaching for the last five years. I've resisted. I've said no to it. I've held on to my corner. I've folded my arms and I've said no, whether it's at home or here. But today, I'm going to listen. And I'm going to allow my heart and my attitude to be changed by the Lord. Not by me, but the preacher is here, I trust, to persuade people on behalf of God. He's not, hopefully speaking, his own words entirely. God forbid. So I would encourage us to be a singing, praising congregation. Just one little thought that I, I don't know where it fits in, but I think I'll throw it out anyway. If you go into a shop and you're trying on new clothes, you go in, put them on, you come out and the assistant says, how was that? Did they fit? No, they didn't fit, but I'll take them anyway. 
No one would say that. You say, I'll put them back. And you see, you'll take them in, but you, you'll go in a misfit. So today, take the garments that God has for you. Take them and they'll fit perfectly for you. And that's, that's an appeal I, I've made several times, many a time. And we're going to conclude by singing that appeal today from an old hymn which says, Who is on the Lord's side? Who is fitting into the Lord's people, his church? Who is, who is not? And it, it is a hymn that divides us. But it shouldn't. It should unite every single person here. And the last line in, in the last voice, I trust that you'll be able to say in your heart, hopefully with your lips, we are on the Lord's side. Saviour, we are thine. Would you promise me to do that today? Would you really promise me? I don't ask much, but I'm asking you, pushing the boat out to, for you to do that. So let's conclude by singing 769, Who is on the Lord's side? to you to be your people, a people blessed of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go before us this day in the peace of Christ. Amen.